Hello, I'm Captain John Conrad, founder of G-Captain. And in the last two weeks, I have given dozens of interviews to major media outlets, including New York Times and The Atlantic and NPR and Al Jazeera. And the question that I've been asked most about that Suez Canal, Suez Canal crisis is, what lessons are we going to learn from this major disaster, right? What lessons can we learn to prevent the next major ship incident? So this video addresses that. I'm going to keep it short. And if you want to know the answer, the quick answer without watching this entire video to that question, the answer, in my opinion, as a licensed ship captain, as someone who has been investigating marine incidents for the last 15 years since I started G-Captain, the answer is zero, zilch, zip, nada, nothing, goose egg. And I'm going to tell you why, <laughs> all right? It's not a happy answer, but let's get right to it. No literature is richer than that of the sea. No story is more enthralling. No tradition is more secure. The man who wrote that is none other than Felix Reisenberg. Wrote many books on life at sea, safety at sea, disasters at sea. He was the John Grisham, the Tom Clancy of his generation, right when we transitioned from sail to steam. And his most famous quote is the Reisenberg saying, and it is inscribed on the fort in New York City at New York Maritime College. And that quote is this one. Sorry, I'm struggling with this a bit. I'm not a video guy. This is my first time with this new video software. But his quote is, the sea is selective, slow at recognition of effort and aptitude, but fast in sinking the unfit. He taught us something. Reisenberg taught us something. That to prevent accidents at sea, and he wasn't the first. The first was probably Joseph Conrad in his amazing book, Typhoon. But he taught us that the safety of future generations is written in the blood of the mariners who went before us. Raise your hand if you've heard that saying before. Future safety regulations, rules, the lessons learned are written in the blood of those who went before us. Problem is, I don't necessarily believe that. At one point, it was most certainly true. And this really came to a pinnacle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over some of these books here. And because it wasn't just the lessons, it was the nature in which we got the information. We didn't get the information 100 years ago from 200-page marine investigative reports that take a year a year to get out. What lessons can be learned there long after people forget about the incident? All right. We are humans, and book after book and study after study tells us that we learn through the art of storytelling. And let me tell you, there were some great books that taught us the lessons, how to be safe at sea. You know, some of those books are just fun books. This is great book, Steaming to Bamboozle by Christopher Buckley, right? I got, I got a, just a pile of books here I want to share with you. There were books from the great books from World War II, A Cold Case in Hell by Robert Kars about the Murmansk runs in World War II and how we brought these supplies to, to Russia, right? Farley Mowat's Great Seas Under, 
the heroic adventures of a gallant ship and the brave men who battled the cruel sea. The Captain by Jan D. Hartog. Want to know the importance of Smith Salvage in the Ever Given and the, and the importance of salvage tugs and having that equipment there? I mean, this is a this is a book that taught us those lessons of salvage. You got B. Travern, the Death Ship, about the treatment of mariners. In Peril by Skip Strong, another one about a captain's resolve and the salvage that made history. Oh man, Reisenberg again, the log of the sea. Super Ship by Noel Mostert. Talking about our ships built too big, our super tankers too big. This was built in the late 70s when you had the Seaways Giant and these mega ships. And the lesson here was yeah, they're too big. We got to build smaller tankers. Mr. Roberts. And the Kane Mutiny, the Kane Mutiny, about leadership at sea and what, it what a great, great leader is, Mr. Roberts, and what a poor leader is, the captains of these vessels. And this goes after a long tradition. I mean, it really first started with the probably the most important book for our safety the last few centuries. Nathaniel Bowditch, American Practical Navigator, which is a bit dry to read now. But you have to understand this was the first book where a galley hand, a cook, could open this book and learn celestial navigation and learn these important concepts for navigating the ship safely at sea. So these books taught us things. They taught us how to operate safely. And they weren't all perfect. Here's a book that's so important, I own two of them. <laughs> the Abandoned Ocean, A History of the United States Maritime Policy. If you want to know why I continue to get on Marad's case, especially now we're two months into the Biden administration and we don't have even a clue who is going to be the next maritime administrator under Pete Buttigieg's thing. We have no clue. If you want to know why we have no clue and why that organization merit is a shell of its former self why well, it was ripped from department of commerce and put in marad and all the lessons that could be learned they're all in here unfortunately we didn't learn those lessons all right but just because but they were out there and most of the most of the time we made improvements. We built smaller tankers. The death ship. We improved the lives of seafarers and seafarers' rights. Gracie Under, we, we did uh, tanker ops, right? Um, oh, it's salvage. We learned better salvage techniques, now to be safer, now not to kill people in those salvage ops. And then we kind of turned... You know, people say that literature dried up. And instead of being taught this and this, I mean, Felix Reisenberg is the hero of my school in New York Maritime College. He went there. He's the most famous person to ever to graduate from there. And yet he was not taught in my four years. Instead of being taught that, we were given this to prevent incidents. Like this, UK p &I clubs, careful to carry. This has excellent information on hazardous material. I'm losing focus showing you this book. Sorry. Let's see if we can bring that back in here. There we go. Um, I could show you this way. Right? So books like this came out, and they were more textbooks. There are more textbooks that show you, and I, and I got tons of these books on Actus and ship sea handling, and I don't mean to pick out, I'm picking this one because it's one of the better ones, but where you have to learn this information in a really dry manner, a lot of facts, a lot of figures, and you can learn things from this book, but it's not really learning things in the same way that you we learned them from Mr. Roberts, right? And things became a textbook. 
You know, here's another great book, and I'm showing these because they're among the best. If you want to know how to operate a ship and why operating costs have been cut over the years and how those cuts, this doesn't talk much about the safety, but it talks about the economics of operating these ships and how they affect the safety, right? So you got all of that. We move to this textbook era, and, and we're still in that textbook era. And people say, well, we don't have the great literature that we did before. So that could be one of the problems, and I'm going to get back to that. But I want to go to the pinnacle, the pinnacle of, the, of actionable books. All right? The absolute pinnacle of actionable books, in my opinion, is this book, Until the Sea Shall Free Them by my good friend Robert Frump. Now, this is the true story of the marine electric sinking. An American flagged uh, ship that was old, it was built in World War II, when the storm broke apart and most of the crew died. And Robert Frump was a journalist with the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Inquirer owner spent a lot of money in the investigative team, which Robert Frump wrote. And this book gave us a number of important things like the division between flag state and classification society. It checks and balances on inspections. But my point is that we made laws based on this book and all these other books that I've showed you. And some of these textbooks, we made laws based on those and those improved our lives. They made the sea safer. And this was really the pinnacle because not only do we make these dry about laws about classification society and, and, and so forth, but we came up with a brand new program, the Rescue Swimmer program. What Robert Frump, in telling this per very personal story, determined was if we want to save these mariners, someone's, someone's got to jump out of the helicopter in the cold water. Someone's got to do that. So... Let me take these headphones off. This is what he showed us. And the rescue swimmer program, people didn't jump out of helicopters before that. That was created after the Marine Electric incident, the investigation, and Robert Frump getting these people interested. See, to get action, to get action at the IMO or the Coast Guard or Mary, you need voters. And voters don't care about us mariners. But they care about stories. They care about books. And Robert Frum showed us the importance of helicopters and rescue swimmers. And that program was born. And since then, rescue swimmers have saved hundreds of lives at sea. So this was really the pinnacle of books making our profession safer. But I got to tell you something. This doesn't happen anymore. That was the pinnacle. And with the Exxon Valdez, we did double hull tankers. And uh, there, there are books um, about the Exxon Valdez that were very popular. And that was kind of the final incident. And there have been great improvements like Intertanko under Richard DeMolin's cha uh, chairmanship really took those lessons from the Exxon Valdez and continues to improve safety throughout the 90s. So it didn't stop abruptly. We continued to learn these lessons, but something happened about the time when I graduated from New York Maritime in 2000. It's we stopped learning the lessons from the sea. Like what's the lesson, the chief lesson of the ever given? The chief lesson is these ships are too big. They're getting to be too big. And talking with the New York Times, Vivian Yee, who's been doing an excellent courage for the time, she said, are we going to learn the lesson now that they're too big? And I said, um, didn't we kind of already learn that lesson? I mean, with the cost of Concordia, the cruise ship that ran aground in Italy, we kind of pretty well determined, and I have that book here from the captain written by him, and I'm mentioned in this book. Uh, I don't know if I should be proud of that or not. But 
just goes Teto. Um, we learn from there that these ships are too big. You, it is. They, I don't care what the circumstances are, because the weather wasn't terrible that night. No matter how perfect the training and the gear and the ships and the water take doors and everything else is, when you have a disaster, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get 5,000 people off the ship. It's just too big. That's the lesson we learned. But we didn't stop building these ships. The appetite for the public to cruise on these, there were no regulations to limit the size. I'd say 1,000, 2,000 passenger ships are more fun. They're better more personal experience, but we didn't stop them. And before that, the BP oil rig disaster. I mean, the main lesson there we learned is it's really hard to stop a well if you mess it up a mile below the sea level. And these mega drill ships, these billion dollar drill ships we built in order to drill in a mile deep water, they're just too big. So again, there was the lesson already of super ship, right? The tankers are too big in the 70s and having these, uh, you know, the Amoco Cadiz and all these super tankers. And we learned that lesson and then we forgot it. The Java Sea incident in the late 70s, American flag drill ship that just disappeared, just disappeared. And we learned that you need a captain in charge, but we forgot that lesson by the time the BP oil rig disaster. And there was a question, was the captain in charge or was the driller in charge? You know, in Exxon Valdez, we learned that we need those double hulls to put a void space in between the water and the cargo. But then we kind of forgot about it. And by the time the Costco Busan ran aground, they were actually putting the fuel up. It was a container ship. They put the fuel in these double bottoms. I mean, they, they're just ridiculous. So not only are we not creating new lessons like we used to, we're reverting back on the lessons that we've already learned, which is doubly troubling in my opinion and now some people say to me john it's because we don't have literature like we had but we don't have felix reisenberg we don't have melville i mean talk about probably the best book of all time if not ask me if you ask literature moby dick the first postmodern adventure was a sea story and they say we don't really have that anymore but i contend that we do I mean, here's here's a great book. It's about a historical thing. Michael Tungus, The Finest Hours. They made a movie. They made a movie out of this. It's a great book. This is a great book. Absolutely amazing. Lots of lessons learned. Published in 2014. But it's useless because the Coast Guard did not read that book and institute new changes. Breaking Ships. Another wonderful book about, you know, the, the deaths of children in shipyards like Alang in India where they drag these ships up onto the beach and they cut them with, they don't even use oxygen acetylene torches. They use natural gas because the oxygen acetylene is too expensive. So you release this natural gas in the hold and there are explosions and death and d horrible deaths, but we're still doing this. We didn't learn the lessons here, guys. And it's not just relatively... I mean, uh, Michael Tongas is famous, but it's he's an author. It's not just the sensationalist, best-selling authors like Tongas. I mean, it is real intellectuals like John McF McPhee, um, an uncommon carrier. He also wrote, I believe it was uh, Looking for a Ship. But John McPhee is a Princeton professor who's won, I, I don't even know how many prestigious awards. Um, author of 27 books and is a staff, permanent staff author of The New Yorker. Princeton's top professor, staff author, he's written, when was this book written? About the difficulties we have in moving tugboats in the Mississippi River. 2006, that's new. We got experts, ship captains, golden stripes. Have you read this book? Which personalizes these lessons learned. So it's not just a static, uh, textbook boring that makes you fall asleep like this it's actually lessons learned from the story of my good friend captain para vs parani excellent book i mean he listened he published this recently and you know how many incident reports there have been ntsb incident reports since 2017 this is, this is a new book how many have have referenced this book when I talk to Coast Guard, NTSB, and overseas investigators, 
I tell him about this book? Do they stop and read this? No. Prani wasted his time, in my opinion. Soul of the Sea, another good friend of mine, Nishan Dejerian. This guy is executive chairman of the um, uh, of this Oceans Council, um, and he's uh, for the for the UN. Um, I forget the name of the project. He's a Oxford trained journalist. Worked for the BBC, then got his master's at at. Uh, Harvard and now works for some of Silicon Valley's top, top guys. He wrote The Soul of the Sea and the Age of the Algorithm. The lessons that we're not implementing. You know, the, the Wakashio, he's famous for reporting, the Wakashio was on a collision course with the beautiful island of Mauritius for two days and no one caught it. And it ran aground and then they called the salvers and there was such a long delay it broke up and spilled oil along the island. And Nishan was so upset because he had already written this book about the importance of getting new technology, of getting Silicon Valley to invest. in Ectus hasn't improved in 20 years, guys. Ectus is, and AIS is over 20 decades old technology. We're still using old-fashioned radars on board ship. And this was 2017. And he might as well not have read it because we have not learned the lessons. We have best-selling Best-selling books, Rachel Slade, Into the Raging Sea, The Sinking of the El Faro. Oh, I can tell you how many tens of thousands of copies Rachel Slade sold with this. Go look at the reviews on Amazon. I mean, this captured a nation, and she talks about it because she waited to release it until after the hearings. How the lessons learned from Bob Frump and others were not brought into the Coast Guard investigation report. And it talks about her frustration about uh, Roth Rothy, the head of the NTSB, being pushed out. I mean, here's the head of the NTSB being pushed out by commercial interests, and I, I frustrates me so much I can't talk about it. Jack Devaney. This guy was the head of uh, naval architecture at MIT. And got in a bet with his brother. His brother was a famous ship uh, owner and owned a big fleet. And his brother said, uh, you teach because you can't do. And Jack said, you know what? And went out and built some of the most amazing ships, the great white fleet of tankers. And he talks about it in here. He talks about it in this book exactly the problems. I mean, if you read one book about the problems of our industry and our failures over the last few years, this is 2006. The impending disaster in tankers. I mean, this is before we even built the first Tripoli, e, Merce built the first Tripoli e megaship. Ja I mean, Jack details our problems in here, and none of his lessons have been instituted in new law. And it's not just us, the richest, most politically influential ship owner in the world. We say, oh, well, Congress doesn't care. In the U.S., Congress doesn't care about the Jones Act, doesn't care about the Mariners. We can't get political support. Well, I don't believe by that reason either because the richest, most influential ship owner in the world is here in the United States. Billions of dollars in budget. And that is the U.S. Navy. And Dr. Sal Marcagliano wrote The Fourth Arm of Defense, The Lessons Learned from Vietnam in How Do You Bring the Bullets, the Ammo, All of the Material Over to War, in this case, Vietnam War. He wrote the lessons... And now we have a rusting, aging fleet. And you talk to any Navy guy or you go to the Nautical Institute and every other article is about how we don't have a merchant fleet anymore. We, we can't defend ourselves. We can't wage a war against China. If China attacks us, we can't do the island hopping because our fleet is so screwed up. And, but I talked to all, all of these articles. No one mentions his book. And of course, my own, Fire on the Horizon. And this brings me to the sad thing. This was the hardest thing I ever did. I mean, I, I went through the, the Maritime Academy and my dad died during that time. You know, I had originally gone to Naval Academy. I had to transfer to New York Maritime because my dad was dying. I had to go home, take care of my brother and my sister. And I had to work jobs through there just to pay because, I mean, it was hard. My, my dad dying. We, we were not a rich family. And I struggled with the school and getting out and 
that was difficult. And then working my way up to captain was difficult. And, you know, runs up to Alaska on super tankers and terrible storms is difficult. But nothing was more difficult than writing this book. I cried all the way through this book about the crew on the Deepwater Horizon and the miraculous job they did. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a, a sad story, but it's also uplifting. The unfortunate men who died in the initial explosion on the BP... You know, they were dead. There was nothing we could do for them. But the, the crew went and saved so many of their fellow crew members with horrific, horrific injuries. And then the Tidewater and the Damian Bankston. And, but there were lessons learned in this book. And Congress invited me to testify. I testified in a congressional committee. Did they really institute more laws? There's certainly more paperwork, more oversight, as they say. Some more stuff the captain has to fill out, but I can't think of any major. I can think of many laws that should have been acted to prevent this in the future, but I don't think any of them will. So that's all I got for you today. And they say that our lessons are learned, regulations are, are made with the blood of mariners who went before us. I'm sorry. I, I can't see evidence, hard evidence that that's true. I think we're regressing, and at the very least, we're, we're, we're forgetting the lessons of the past. And when we have an incident, we are actively not learning those lessons. That's, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. I am Captain John Conrad, founder um, and CEO of gcaptain.com, and I hope this video gives you a little insight into the maritime world and uh, disaster response. Take care.